Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, to conduct this meeting wholly electronically uh, and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the Wetlands Board um, needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit cumbersome, so I ask for your patience. Uh, audibility of members' voices. First, because each member of the Wetlands Board is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all other members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call, or I'm going to ask Catherine to conduct a roll call, uh, uh, and ask each Wetlands Board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. Catherine, would you please call the roll? Okay, sure. Um, Dean Costello. This is Dean. I'm calling from my home in Springfield. All right, Dean. Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, Caitlin. I've got the list in front of me. If that would help, <laughs> give me a second. No, um, I was just gonna say, Deanna, are you are you here? I see her on the line. Um, um, the, oh, there you are. Are you hearing me? Yes. Um. Okay, good. Um, I'm uh, calling from my home in, in um, Rose Hill. Okay, perfect. So, Clyde, um, I am not seeing any other members on the line. I do not see Kim. I also well, I know Kim was intending to participate. Um, right now, I believe we only have three board members. And we need one more, right? Yes, we do. And Bert had already let us know that he was not going to be able to make it. So. Um, let me give a call to Kim because I, I know she was working this afternoon on this and she had some trouble getting on last time. So let me give her a ring. Okay. Hold tight, everyone. Um, I see someone else join the call. If you are Ken, let us know. Katie, I see that uh, Larry Zaragoza is on the on the, in the meeting. Yes, he's not a board member of the for the wetlands board. He is not. So anyone who just joined the call, we're just waiting a moment to try to get in touch with one of the Wetlands board members. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> She's not answering. Um, I also have not heard much from Doug recently. I'm sorry. I have not heard much from Doug Klein either. Um, I don't know if anyone else has heard from the wetlands board. Time for calling Doug. Hi, Doug. We've got a weapons board meeting tonight and we don't have a quorum. Looking for you to join. This is why. Bye. We try Kim once more. Not getting an answer. So, um, as long as we have Mark here, Mark, uh, I'm kind of assuming we really can't have this meeting without uh, without a quorum, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, uh, Alan, there's an Alan. Is Alan on the board? I don't know who Ellen is, I'm afraid, but you're a visitor. I would um, encourage anybody who's not talking to turn off their microphone. So what time is it? Seven ten. Um Mark, I would propose that we hold on here until 715, but if we don't obtain a quorum, we'll simply have to reschedule. That sounds like a good plan. We do have two additional phone number people here. Can I ask them to identify themselves? There's two 202 numbers. Um, I just tried to unmute them. I know one person is calling in from the Mount Vernon uh, Council of Citizens Association. So I know I know that one person had is on the line. I'm not sure about the other.
Hello? Can anybody hear me? Come in. Hello? Yes. Who is this? Uh, this is uh, Peter Burnett, and uh, I've been on the phone for a while. I understand that we're having a meeting, but you don't have a quorum. I, I represent the Mount Vernon Civic Association, and I'm the chair of the Recreation and Environmental Committee. So I was asked to come and join this uh, this meeting. Well, welcome, but so far we do not have a meeting, and uh, because of the nature of the Wetlands Board, unless we have a quorum, we can't uh, discuss any official business. I see. Well, uh, Doug, do you what, think what we could establish a, uh, a proposed date for, the, for a reschedule with the people we have here? I, I'm, Mark, do you think we could do that? Could we uh, at, at least propose a calendar date for Kelly to move forward with? I'm not sure um, the effectiveness of setting a date when we don't even have a quorum. Um, well, at least we'd have that date for have, three of us. What do we have, two, two people? Uh, three. The what, three Wetlands Board members? Yes. We only need one yeah. more. Well, you can... You can dis you can dis certainly discuss options for the next meeting, but I would think that sending out potential dates by email would be a more effective method. Yeah, for, I think we're going to have to do for, that anyway. For, for getting consensus, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to make a proposal. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dina and, and, uh, and Doug, uh, how about a week from today, Monday the 20th? Is that good for you? Uh, that's, that's good for me. Yeah, that's fine. So, um, Catherine, is that all right with you? Um, I, yes, I just will, everyone needs to be cognizant of the fact that I need to publish that on the Fairfax County public calendar. So um, I will do that first thing in the morning. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I think we may have Kim. Kim just sent a message, a question. You see that question come through? No. There's a question from 703. That may have been to my phone. Yes, uh, we may have Kim here. Um, uh, she just needs the uh, the web access code. Do you know that? To be able to look this up right now, couldn't I? send this to her uh, she's talking to me on text um, on the opening page there's a meeting number is that what she needs she needs the phone number oh and, and the uh, the meeting access number. Does she want me to email that to her? I don't, I don't have think her so. Phone. I think she's on her phone, which is part of the problem. All right, I just put uh, it in the chat. I'm sorry, say again? I just put the phone number and the access code in the chat. Yeah, but she's not there. I, I know, I, but I, I thought phone. you could see it and type it to her on your phone.
Yes. Oh, God. They have made this any more complicated? It's Kim Larkin. Oh, Kim. Made it in. <laughs> we have a quorum. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me begin again. Uh, conduct this meeting holding electronically and to effectuate both emergency procedures authorized by FOIA. The Wetlands Board needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's a bit cumbersome. I ask your first because each member of this wetlands board is participating in this meeting from separate locations. We must verify that a quorum of members is participating and each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all of the members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each wetlands board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. I'm going to do the roll call. Uh, first, uh, Dean Costello. This is Dean. I'm calling from my home in Springfield. Bert Kramer. Bert Kramer is absent. Deanna Crumbling. Present and calling from my home in Rose Hill. Kim Larkin. I'm here and I'm calling from my home in Alexandria, Virginia. And, Fairfax County. And Doug Klein. Hearing that from Doug, uh, we have four members and uh, we ha at, at this point, I ask Kimberly Larkin to accept the virtual gavel as chairperson pro tem so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. Kim, do you have the gavel? I will accept the gavel. I move that each member's and voice is adequately heard by each other member of this weapons board. I, I heard everyone from my end. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. I will accept the gavel back. We have a quorum of members. So. The uh, first item on the uh, agenda here is to discuss uh, the committee revisions that were developed uh, at the last meeting. Uh, Dean, you're first up uh, on this. You want to discuss your review of the board manual. That's fine. Um, Katie, do you want to go ahead and bring up? Uh, there we go. And the first line, I believe, is on page four towards the top. All right, I can take it from there. Um, my thinking here is that I'm assuming that this section is going to be revised and that this uh, revision is in the works somewhere. But I just want to be mindful that the definition of a living shoreline as defined in 104.1a needs to be included to match uh, SB 776. Now, Katie, does that make sense to you? I just want to make sure that I'm doing these revisions in a in an appropriate manner. Well, well, Doug, this is the uh, the wetlands ordinance. I think really what we need to do is simply replace it in whole with the new ordinance. That's what I figured. I just wanted to make sure. That's why I phrased it like a revision was coming, but I wasn't sure of the details. That's why I just wanted to make sure that my approach here was appropriate. Yeah, the, the revision has occurred and it is passed. Okay. 
Uh, let's see here. Katie, page 14, please. Let's let me get down to page 14 myself here. 12, 13, 14. There we go. I wasn't sure whether or not that this should include uh, 28 to 104. And the reason that I bring it up is that there is a very nice line in 28 1 204. If you'll hang on just a moment, let me bring it up real quick. I have a bunch of uh, windows open for reference, so bear with, please. And here. So while he's looking at everybody's edification, uh, 100 and 104 are MRC and the new updated law. So uh, if you're thinking of putting them in here, uh, Doug, I would agree. Dean. Okay. That's what I, yeah, I was assuming that. Of course, I'm gummed up in my all my windows. I've literally have about twenty of them here. Uh, there, there, here, here, there, there. Somebody else's. Don't care about that. Over that, over that way. I was looking for my text of seven seventy six. That's where I got gummed up here. Irritating. Um, Dean, is, is this a section in the PDF that you mm -hmm. think you edited? No, it or... wasn't in this. Oh, okay. I'm still looking at uh, at the page 14 reference. And uh, what there is, is there's a statement in 104 that just comes right out and says, look, you've got to pay attention to sh the living shoreline. And I thought that that was impressive, to, uh, impressive enough to bring it back into this document somewhere. That's why I was thinking 104 plus 1300 to 1300, 1308, I think it is. Yeah, it's quite long. Yeah. The, the 1300 has got a whole bunch of provisions. A lot of which are mostly about VMRC, but right. uh, I, uh, you know, frankly, I think we should put them in the board book. Okay. I don't think that's a bad idea. Uh, where has it gotten to? Here. I have no idea what happened to my uh, 776. Do you have 776 uh, handy, Katie? The law itself? No. Yeah. Are you thinking uh, of putting that in? Not the whole thing, just uh, making reference to uh, 282104. Does everybody agree? Is that okay with everybody else? Yeah, Dean, if you propose that, go ahead. Okay, that's fine. I, I, this is meant to be a discussion here. It's kind of hard to do in this forum, but mm. uh, I, Deanna, I can't see you or uh, Kim. Are, are the two of you in agreement to put 776 in? I think it makes sense to put it in there, just as a reference. I don't want the whole thing. Okay. It's fine with me. Then it gets too long, yeah. Yeah, the seventy seventy the seven seven six write ups were only about. Mm, I don't think they were more than like two, maybe three pages. Does that sound right, Katie? Yeah, but there are also updates to to chapter thirteen and one hundred four. So right, like, everything that's in there is already covered. Uh, yeah. In the reg, I think. Uh, so so you know, if you just wanted to dip just the introduction, I I think that would be fine. Okay. That'll work. Dina, does that match what you were trying to say? I'm sorry, I can't see your face. <laughs> Who, me? Dina. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I said it was fine with me. I think it was Kim that had more more substantial comment. All right. Got it. Jump in if you need to. <laughs> okay. Do you want to move on to the next one, Katie? Page 42. And 42, the approval criteria. My note is that it seems that uh, the living shorelines concept as a preferred approach should be emphasized here maybe as an addition to either C2A, uh, right here, reference again to 282-104. But that said, I'm not sure how easy it is to change a wetlands board bylaw. Uh, it requires a vote of the board. No, oh, that's easy enough. It, it, it's, there are bylaws. Mm -hmm. So it's my understanding that the board itself can change those. So if you want to propose some specific language for that, we could take that up at any meeting you so propose. Okay, I can do that. I'll go ahead and write up the t uh, text. We need to do a whole resolution to do it, but we can do it. Okay. Well, I think it makes sense at this time to maybe, you know, if that's going to be the way it's going, I don't, it makes sense to make some suggestions if needed and, and see where we are. So yeah, I guess send that around and then go to the next board meeting with it or next wetlands board meeting for everyone to sign off on them. I think we're going to probably, uh, yes, Kim, I think but I, before we do a sign off, I, I think I'm gonna try to do an, a more open public meeting where we, we invite everybody who's commented on all this stuff to actually see the documents so we'll have to put them up someplace where they're easily reviewed by the public in general and i think we may actually have a hearing on the proposed change that makes, that makes sense i mean i know we've heard a lot of concern about the living shorelines approach anyway yeah i i i think we i i think i'd like to put all this together in one package and you know do an outreach for public comment and uh, then, uh, then I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, I, I'm sorry, that's a little off the agenda here, but uh, I, I think that's what we discussed last time. I'm sorry, Dean, we took your time away there. Keep going. Not a problem. Uh, next one is on page 55. And this is just basically a comment because the next several comments that I had were predicated on the county wetland mitigation and compensation policy. Again, not sure how open that is to change. I would assume it's much more difficult than changing the board bylaws, but I'm not sure about the details. Um, I think the signature on this again, if you go down to the bottom, isn't the signature on this the board itself? Yes. Yeah, yeah the board did this. Okay, I wasn't since it was county policy, I wasn't sure how easy or difficult it would be to change something like this. That's why it's I was title wetlands board policy. Okay. Uh, it can't override uh you know VMRC rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and you know, just writing a policy doesn't necessarily mean that VMRC would agree with it. Right. But, but it, it, obviously we don't want to write something that they won't agree with uh, uh, or they would feel necessary to override. Mm -hmm. But I think that the general rule here is if we do something that's reasonable and thoughtful uh, and, and supports the intent uh, that, that uh, you know, BMRC is not going to override it typically. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I'm proposing anything that's uh, too abrupt, we'll say. Right. Uh, 
but we we probably we probably will ask you know BMRC to be one of the groups of people that comment on all these changes that we're thinking of making. Oh, makes sense. Uh, first thought here on page 56 for the resolution. It's I just have a, a this is a general comment for this particular section. Have any of the citations changed? I'm just not positive. I just want to make sure that that was addressed somewhere along the way. I don't think so. I think those are the same. Sounds good to me. Um, okay. you know, one thing about this, uh, uh, Dean, you've looked at this. Um, I, I think we, do, just as a poll of the people here, uh, I think we want to make it clear that if you do a living shoreline, the board is open to waiving the compensation. Uh, mm. I, does it say that right now? I don't think it does, does it? No. Uh, so so let's, let's do a little poll here. Uh, I, I would be in favor of being you know, open to waiving the uh, uh, mitigation fees where uh, uh, a, uh, an applicant is, is timely, uh, works with the wetlands board, and also uh, uh, is putting a, a living shoreline in place. Uh, uh, Deanna, what do you think of that? I agree. If they're putting a living shoreline in place, they should not have to pay the mitigation fee. Kim? Yeah, this is Kim. I, I agree as well. That's how the Corps of Engineers is handling it for other types of projects. They're not requiring mitigation for most living shoreline projects, unless it's where you've got a bulkhead and then you're doing elements of living shoreline where it's not quite is equal, but a full on living shoreline, they are not typically requiring mitigation for that stuff. So I, I would agree with that. So Dean, you get the joy of trying to figure out how to say that. <laughs> I don't know. I like saying whereas as much as the next person. <laughs> okay. I also found a nice spot probably in that last paragraph uh, that talks about no net loss of jurisdictional title title wetlands. So that's probably a good place to park it. Uh, let me go yeah. back up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it seems reasonable to me in that location. That sounds like a yeah. good place. Uh, I hate to go back to it, but uh, in that first whereas um second paragraph which references uh 1301 to 1308 should that also include uh that bugaboo of mine section 104 the one that says that thou shalt use a living shoreline as much as practical it can or is it worth okay all right let's see here next issues next page I was proposing another number three here. So there'd be one, two, three, four entries uh, in the sub area here. And the third one will be text that regards the applicability of a living shoreline to this. And I know I keep harping on it, but it seems like it, sh it should be fairly strongly encoded into the wetlands board policy. So I was thinking about probably, number one, first avoid impacts to tidal wetland then minimize unavoidable impacts to tidal wetland. Three, uh, con consider uh, a living shoreline as the preferred alternative. And then four, offsetting the remaining un unavoidable uh, wetland. So That's what I, I was thinking. The concept of what you're doing, Dean, but the mm -hmm. problem you've got is this, whereas is 404 of the Clean Water Act. And ah, a very good point. You, yeah, I don't think you can, you could do it, but. No, the core might There's be probably better point. places. Yeah. It, it, I, All I, right. I, this this is the core's language. Uh, I'll leave I'll leave the core be. Yeah. Okay. I I'll fi figure out a place in like those uh, previous two paragraphs. I think I think I can get it in there without a lot of trouble. 
not in USAC. And then, Dean, I was wondering, and I don't know if we want to approach that now, but somewhere where you have that discussion about, you know, the the process of working through a living shoreline, right. do we want to then refer them to the checklist or um, something that gives them, I don't know, you know, the ability to, and, and we can discuss it later, Clyde, because I'm probably jumping in on the agenda, but... Um, you know, the ability to maintain what they have or restore what they have or do a combination kind of thing or I, I don't know, that checklist kind of comes in handy. Um, but it's not done yet again. We're still in draft. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. Honestly, I'm not sure where to place it. And I think the checklist is a part of the wetlands manual. So I think it could be referenced within the text without a lot of trouble. That makes sense to me. So, so there's a little bit of a point of order here. Uh, the the uh, this is a policy. We'll vote on it as a policy. Um, I'm not sure that we've been thinking of the checklist as a policy. Not um, really. I wasn't. Yeah, I've been thinking of the checklist as something that could be be updated regularly. You know, um, and if we make it a policy, then we we'd have to change it all the time. We'd have to, you know, have a hearing on it and adjust it a lot. Uh, that might be a little hard to do. I think there's text towards the end of the manual that can, uh, that kind of information could be added to without a lot of trouble. All right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what page number off the top of my head because it's been a while since I uh, was looking at this. But I think there is something that that uh, can be made clearer and uh, right. make a reference there. Um, the, so when we get to the the, the applicant guide piece, uh, let's come back to this subject. Okay. Let's see. Next one is all title wetland permit. On the second page. Um, first avoid an efforts to be made to the unavoidable. This looks like it's mapping to the, this is the A section on the second page, um, where it has another three entries, but it looks like that maps onto the Army, uh, Army Corps 404 permit. So I'm going to go ahead and just remove that comment, I think. Okay. Let's see here. Yep. All right. Let's see. Next one. This is at the very bottom of the page where it's referring to the wetlands board for the county of Fairfax. Is it time to change the chair and the staff names on here? Or is this one of those things that should just stay the way it is? No, no, if we, uh, if we change it in any way, I don't think I'm going to ask Glenda to sign it. <laughs> Might be a little tricky. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Let's see. That's 58. Okay. I think the next one is on page 110. Let me skip down a little ways here. Wetland outreach for sure. Sorry. Well, going back to what you were saying, Clyde, about a checklist, I think possibly in the section that begins on page 105, talking about the supplemental information form, I think somewhere in there might be a good place to have a reference to a checklist. What do you think? I think the checklist is a part of the supplemental information form. Oh, okay. And, and maybe we have some terminology we have to clean up there. Yeah. Uh, maybe having two names is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, 
so the supplemental information form, Catherine, it, it includes stuff from outside the wetlands board, right? Uh, well, it references to the JPA and it gives quite a bit of background information as we're trying to provide, you know, a summary of what's required. Um, and then because it is able to then on, on the second page of that document, explain what the county's position is. Um, and, and the additional information that the county usually likes to see. Yeah, I, I wonder if we're, we're running into a problem of getting redundant with this. Um, my fault, I did not look at this enough when I did the section I wrote, but there's a lot of this stuff that we could really put into one section rather than two. All right, I'll, I'll just have to work on that. But it, it does seem like the checklist becomes a part of this document. Right, I mean, the hope is, is that we would give this supplementary information to an applicant that's close to having a complete application and they could use this to help make sure that they're checking all of those those boxes of what the county wetlands board wants to see right so so kim this affects your checklist yeah it does i think that's where we need to kind of i i think we need to tread a little lighter on requirement required information as to preferred information and I, I, I know that's something something that maybe we need to have a conversation about it to you know we would like to have this information but if it comes at a absorbent cost or um, difficulty for them to like you know the femic the cemetery, we'd like to have that, but that could be a very expensive thing to do, depending on how far you have to go. So, I don't know. Maybe we can talk more about what's on the checklist and how to consider applicants' concerns, I guess, for required and preferred. So let's have that general conversation just for a moment. And again, sorry to kind of interrupt on your agenda item here. Not a problem. We have uh, a law, uh, 776, which we absolutely have to follow. Then we have guidelines from VMRC, and, and they are guidelines. Now, um, Mark, you can jump in here if you disagree. I, guidelines to me are something that we would normally follow. However, if in a particular situation, there's a reason to vary from those guidelines without changing their intent, then an applicant and a board can consider that. Uh, Mark, are you with me on that? Or, or would you rather not opine? Which which Mark are you talking to? <laughs> uh, the county attorney. Um, at seven forty, Mark chat that he left the meeting okay well we don't have that answer then so um uh, we can run that past that the county attorney is supposed to help us with this kind of thing but uh it, i have had a conversation with some other wetlands boards around the state and and, and they're looking at the uh the vmrc guidelines and and seeing there are sometimes are cases for very minor applications where doing the bathymetry would be um, over the top uh, and not necessarily expected. 
So perhaps we have to write something that, that tells an applicant that's possible to do, but they have to justify. So uh, let me ask the other Mark. <laughs> Mark Eversall, are, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the VMRC guidance are, are, they're pretty clear. You know, we want this in an application, but they are guidelines. Uh, uh, are you asking every single permit application to dot every I and cross every T in those guidelines? In the application, some counties are doing better than others. They're all striving to this, but they're not, I don't think all wetland boards are requiring all the information yet. Um, well, do, do, you, do you think the MRC would take umbrage at us saying that, you know, for some really minor permit things like a, a bulkhead maintenance that maybe it isn't necessary to delineate the, uh, uh, the, the extent of the uh, the NOAA climate change elevation. I I think you have that. I, I'm sorry, Mark. Way. I think you've got that way. Yes. All right. So, so the challenge for us is guiding the applicant in into when they can or cannot when, when they have to really do every dang thing that's in the VMRC list and. I don't think we can tell them they don't have to do it. I, I think we, we, we may want to convey to them that perhaps for a first application, uh, they could start with a, a minimalist kind of application. However, if they don't make a case for not doing the other things, they're going to be required to do it. That, that's my thought about this. Can I just pull the group? What, what do you think about that? I think it might be better to have the applicant propose not having to do something as opposed to starting off with them not having to do something and then we add and then we add then we add that almost seems not fair because it's I'm not going to say it's moving goalposts or anything like that but it just seems more reasonable. It's like, okay, if you don't want to do like the uh, uh, bathyscaphy, I don't know how to pronounce that right. Okay, tell us why. That's all. Chances are we might not let it. We might let it go depending on the size of the project. But I think it's up to them to kind of say why or why. Them, what do you think? Yeah, I think people get. I know our citizens, when they, they go to get a permit, they get kind of overwhelmed with looking at all of the things that are required um, and just the dollar sign. So I, I, get, I get both points. I guess I struggle with this every day is to say, maybe we could just point out if, you know, if you cannot provide the information, please provide reasoning why this information cannot be provided or will not be provided. And then we could always ask for it and just say, no, we can't issue a permit without it, or it's something where the action is, it won't be necessary. I mean, I, I can see both points. I just feel like a lot of people are overwhelmed when they look at what this application would require. Yeah, I think that's really gonna be the case. Uh, uh, Deanna, what do you think? I agree with what you said previously. So, let me express a little of my thoughts on this. It's it's very common for the county to get an application and and then respond back saying we need all these additional things. In fact, that's kind of the norm. Um, I, I I I wonder if I'm kind of back at the idea that. There is a minimum amount of information that that ought to come in on that very first application, and it, it might be better to let staff tell them we think you ought to provide all of this additional information unless you give us a reason not to. So I, I realize I'm introducing a, a two-step process and putting a little burden on staff, 
But I think staff has got that burden anyway. Because whenever they look at one of these things, they're trying to figure out what else they need. Catherine, jump in here. What do you think? You're muted, Catherine. Yeah, sorry. I just had to get my mute in between my screens here. Um, I mean, I think whichever way you all decide to go, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, you know, in my perspective, I'm always going to err on the side of what BMRC's guidelines recommend. And um, at this point, it may be that their guidelines aren't super specific about what's required versus a preferred and nice to have. So, you know, I guess we could also take into consideration conditions that we see more frequently in Fairfax County or better use of other available that might be open to the public. Um, that that might be suitable to use that we could take into consideration. So the, the real question here is, do we write this saying uh, something like, you know, here are minimum things you absolutely must submit and uh, the rest is also required unless you make a case that it's not required or if we tell them you must submit this absolute minimum, submit the additional information you think may be required, uh, and any information you don't supply, you may be required to to provide justification. Something like that. Yeah, Con. I think we're looking at the JPA. Okay, so the joint permit application has a checklist in it already. Right. Of what needs to be provided. And maybe that's the minimum, but I know bathymetry is in there. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because we're kind of also fighting, you know, what's already in the joint permit application as to what's required elements. Um, well, Kim, this is, this is in your shop. This is yeah. your review. <laughs> so I, I tell you what, here's a suggestion so we don't spend all night on this. No. Why don't you write it up two ways? Write it up two ways and we'll accept public comment on those two ways. How does okay. that sound? Does yeah. we go out to the public and say, here's two ways we could do this. If you, you know, regulators do this all the time when they go out for public comment. Rather than say, we're gonna do this, they say we have these two options. We want to take comment on it. Uh, let, let's let's give them a, a pretty strict interpretation. That's not completely strict, but uh, but then one that's a little less burdensome. And, and Kim, you can write that any way you want. Uh, okay. Because if we're going out for public comment on it, then uh, then we don't have to decide right now. But I I, uh, I, I do think this is a very important thing. Uh, because the, the comment we've been getting from the public is that that the BMRC guidance is very burdensome for what might be considered minor things, you know, like bulkhead maintenance. Do you think it might be worthwhile having actual categories like maintenance goes to the uh, small scale, but like putting in a a pure bulkhead kind of uh, project goes to the larger scale. I think, yes, I think that might be really good. Uh, I, <laughs> people are looking for a streamlined way to do bulkhead and seawall maintenance. Yeah, I think if we list like, there's like four or five categories that you don't have to go full, uh, full bore on this, but then there might be another, the rest of them you do have to, unless you maybe they can if they can give us a good justification why they don't have to. Right. Like class class of action. Yeah. You know, we could do it like a class of action that there's a lot of places to do that. Okay, I'll come up with some ideas. Right. I like that but, one. Uh, but a little side comment. I think that no matter what those classes are, we should tell the applicant that this can be their first application, but it's possible that staff will ask you for more. Uh, I, I don't think we should tell them definitively 
this list is it. Uh, because often when you get these things in, things pop up that, uh, as Ms. Crumbling has told me often, that you really know what, that's what's going to happen until you actually get the application. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. I'll okay. Sounds Very good. good. Sorry, I didn't feel the thunder. <laughs> Uh, let's see, there's something. Um, oh, I should point out also on page three, uh, on 107, I think just a page up or so, there is reference to a living shoreline treatments. So it's not been, it. living shoreline is in here. It's just not in a lot of places. That's all. As you can see it like right there in the middle of the uh, page that uh, Katie has up. Yeah, I, I think this, this supplementary information form is going to be a very part, important part of what we go to the public with. And it, it's, it's going to, there's going to be a fair amount of work needed on it. Right. Let's see here. Next one, page 110. Oh, yeah. A quick comment about the outreach brochure. Uh, just recommending adding some text to it about living shorelines, including the definition in the glossary. As you can see further down in here, there is a glossary for uh, for the brochure, and probably uh, living uh, shorelines should be included in there. Okay. Yeah, there it is on page uh, 116. Well, we have a uh, wrap. Uh, outreach brochure in front of us. Right. Okay. And the last, the last comment I have is on page 118, which is talking about the uh, board roster. That just needs to be updated. Okay. And we need to fill in some slots. Are we that low? Yes. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> As evidenced by tonight's meeting, that almost ah, didn't good happen. Point. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Who's up next? I, I've lost my agenda. I know I've lost mine too. Hold on one second. <laughs> Um, I have the living shoreline policy and application guide. So let me see if I can pull that up. Okay. So while Catherine is trying to pull this up, when Deanna and I started to write this, you kind of realized that, that the, the one we have now is really not about just wetlands. It's, it's, it's really a more general guide. So we've proposed changing this to the title that you see there, the Fairfax County uh, Guide for Tidal Wetlands. Um, Catherine, I think you can take down the checklist for now. Is that up on your board? There you go. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I've got two computers here. I'm trying to move everything around. Um, so Clive, can I just ask a question that you're kind of doing, you guys are proposing that we kind of migrate this from a policy document to a application guide. Is that, is that kind of where you were going with this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um. And, and it's really written such that so somebody can read through here and know what they're facing. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that's that's in the uh, supplemental information document, you know, where you're explaining things, I, I think if we're going to keep that, it might be better moved here.
but kept to a minimum. I, I, I don't want this to get so long that somebody can't get through the thing. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I think what's happened in, in listening to the people who come to our public hearings and the people who have been trying to understand the new law, it's very difficult for somebody out there in the public to know really what this is all about. And, and this I think is meant to be the thing that, you know, after somebody has read the outreach document, they can go in and take a look at this and then a actually see and think about what they're facing. So, uh, Kim, you gave a, a number of editorial comments here. I, I don't see any problem with any of those. Are there any of those you want to discuss? I don't think so. A lot of them were just to clarify, I guess, um, you know, the purpose or the, the, you know, the full scope of the, of the policy or whatever. So I don't think it was a lot. I think we're fine with if you guys are okay with the changes or you want to discuss any of those, I'm fine with that. All right. I do want to discuss, if you could go back up a little bit, Catherine, the piece I haven't read there. Uh, we may have already kind of solved this. So a, a little background here. You know, we have a, a lot of people who are, are reading the, the new wetlands law, you know, the 776 law and saying the state's coming from our front yard. Uh, that they're going to ask us to take out our bulkhead. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking for language here that communicates that that's not the case. Uh, uh, so what you know what I said here was, you know, things that were rip wrap or bulkheads that are in good order just needed repair. Uh, you know, do we want to say will in most cases? Uh, be able to obtain permanent fuel. What, what tone do we want to set with that language right there? I, I, so I, I you know, having I think listened we need to, to say something like currently serviceable, like it's not like the bulkhead, the violation that we have, in my opinion, that thing had been deteriorated to the point that it was non functional, right? But do we so I. Yeah, there, there, I, I think we can work on that. But what I'm proposing here is two different ways of saying this. One, we could say if you need a bulkhead prepared, you know, it'll be considered. Or should we just say, will in most cases obtain permanent level, and and then we can put the caveats on it. Well, if I if I could, this is kind of a little lesson learned that I. That I learned from Mark Eversall a few months ago. I mean, if you're talking about the status of a bulkhead, I think the way Kim mentioned it makes a lot of sense for you all to consider. But I will say, if, if it cut, if you're talking in terms of how the shoreline moves over time, and what that means for loss or gain of a property, um, you know, there there is state code specifically defining where. Um, where title property begins and where it ends as it relates and Mark ever saw, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but as it relates to um, the mean low water level, correct? Are you out there, Mark, if you can, if you're still on the line and can comment on that. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, Virginia is a low water state, meaning if you own riparian property, you own to the low tide line. And that right. that shifts if the if the if the land accretes, you own to the new low tide line. If the land erodes, you own to a lesser you own lesser property. If that makes sense, but yeah, you you own to the mean to mean low tide line. So yes, and Mark, that's what I obviously remember you reminding me of and pointing me to that state code. So. That may be a little nugget of information that could be useful here. Yeah, I, I think we should add that to this piece because I don't think people know or understand that. Uh, and when we get to the checklist, it, it comes back again. 
Um, but how do we, what's the tone we set here? Do, do we say to, to people, you know, bulkheads that have been well maintained or whatever else we say about them will generally be considered favorably by the wetlands board? Uh, or, or do we say will in most cases be uh, obtained affirmative goal? How do we want to say that? I think it, a couple of words here are going to be really important to how the public perceives this and, and whether or not we get it past you know, everybody who's interpreting the law. Yeah, Claude, maybe that's where we go into saying, you know, well-maintained, existing well-maintained structures. Yeah, well, let's uh, say we say all that. Let's say that we say people who meet all these criteria, but what do we say next? Do we then say- I don't say, think we want to say they're going to be approved. I think we want to say- Will be considered. Yeah, but that, 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 that doesn't tell anybody anything. Yeah, I, but but that's that's an option. Will be considered. That's one of my options. But I don't think that's going to satisfy these people who are worried about their loss of land. And I right. frankly I don't blame them. And and I guess the other point about this, no one I've talked to, no one at BIMS, BMRC, the people who worked on the law, nobody said they intended to remove existing well maintained bulkheads. So I I guess I'm asking the board. How do we convey that to people that the intent uh, uh, of this new law is not to require you to remove a bulkhead that's well maintained? Maybe put something like that, like right up in the introduction, pretty much right straight up ahead. Something like keep in mind that this guidance is not meant to remove a well maintained bulkhead. It is designed to da, 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 from there. All right. You know, now that I said that and you repeated back to me, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, I've been struggling with how to say that. I also think that, you know, bulkheads are not the only other consideration for, for a man-made structure in these areas. Um, just because there is a, there are properties with quite a bit of riprap and how do we how, how does the wetlands board want to look or consider that? Or is that just not, you know, or do you all want to follow more of the VMRC guidance there? I think we just say well maintained functional measures, maybe or something structures. Defensive structures. Well, that, that, that's easy. You know, we we could just say well maintained, previously approved uh, uh, erosion control structures. Uh, however, uh, where uh, structures are not well maintained, or where other circumstances. Uh, indicate that such structures are no longer appropriate, uh, the wetlands board will need a full application to consider it. Something along that line. I hate to bring it up, but how do you define well-maintained in this context? You do. Ah, uh, okay. Why, Not a problem. you're on the board. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is why they pay the big ducks, Dean. This is what you're getting that big money payout for. Oh, all right. <laughs> Did, no, I'm with you now. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I, I'm glad we had this. I've been struggling with that, uh, that that discussion a bit. Um, okay. Did I? Anybody else have things they wanted to discuss on this? Oh yeah, where it says discuss. <laughs> so here's this this language. Uh, I, I want to point out to everybody uh, that either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, the law 
says that VMRC uh, can only issue uh, uh, permits where uh, a, a living shoreline is suitable. They must require living shorelines where suitable according to the best available science. That's what the law says for VMRC. But the law, and I'm talking about the law, not the regulations, state that the wetlands board can can uh, approve or deny wetlands subject to the minimum standards. But we're only bound by where suitable. The, the words best available science are not in the law as it applies to the wetlands board. Uh, so, however, I, I think that both VMRC, the staff, and everybody else really wants the wetlands boards to use the language that, that applies to VMRC. That is, we're suitable according to the best available science. But I, I want everybody to know that that's not what the law says. Uh, are you, everybody with me on this? I, I know this is a nuance, but I, I, I think I would be remiss in not pointing it out. I like it, actually. I like it better that way. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm not trying to stick it to the legislatures or BMRC. I do think we are definitely going to, you know, uh, use the, the, the BIMS guidance wherever possible. But we do have a memorandum from VIMS telling us that they recognize that we have other things to consider. Uh, that maybe VMRC can't. I'm not sure I'm not sure I agree with that, Mr. Chairman. I think yeah, I, I, I I know. I, go ahead, Mark. Please comment. Please go ahead. I think the way I think the way the law is written, and I'm I'm not an attorney, but they they reference the commission. And the commission is acting as the wetland board, and I think the wetland boards need to obey the law the same way that the commission does when acting as the wetland board. And and I guess what I'm trying to say, Mark, is I think that that's my intent, in part because I I, I think that. In the discussion that we had at the public hearings uh, on the BRC guidance, that that's exactly what was discussed. Right. However, that's not what the law says, uh, and I I guess I, I I feel like I have to keep my board knowledgeable, uh, and you know there's a there's a lot of reason to try to make this law work even if it's not perfect, uh, and and I think we're all going to do that. Uh, you know, and, and I think we, we should, you know, listen to and respect Mark's opinion here as well as mine. Uh, anybody else want to talk about that? Uh, it, this is Kim. I think we have a, at least as a county wetlands board, we have a, maybe more of a, Needed to try to be um, maybe not let the science rule, as, but also consider the other alternatives. I, I don't know. I I'm not a lawyer either. I just feel like part of our edict when we when we become board members is to consider all of the options and considerations, constraints. That's just me. All right. If, if there's no more comments on this, I, I'd like to move on to the, the next piece and kind of recognizing that the next piece needs to be coordinated quite a bit more with the supplemental uh, guidance. Uh, so, so, Kim, uh, you started here with my very rough uh, checklist that I did myself. 
uh, the, the comments that are here were, were meant for our discussion. I, I, I don't think we really want those comments at our checklist. Uh, <laughs> so, so this may take a little bit of work, but why don't you go ahead and talk through what you've got? Well, I, you know, I don't have, I'm sorry, I'm calling in on the phone today. So, um, some of the comments I had, and, and I guess the biggest one is to make sure at the end of our checklist that we, there was an edict when the board approved the, the, the regulation or, um, was to, there's a couple things that uh, Supervisor Stork brought up that he wanted us to make sure that was in our consideration. And that, that was my biggest comment, I think, um, was in our consideration for what the appropriateness of a particular measure. Um, so I did include the one directly from uh, their finding, um, and what Mr. Stork uh, added at the end of the approval. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of those and um, included those in the considerations for an East Shoreline project. Um. Catherine, can I share my uh, uh, my screen for a moment? Yes, let me let me do that. Hold on one second. I've got a. Sorry, I've got some. Uh, I, I tried to. I tried to make you the presenter. Um, but let me know if that didn't come up for you. You can try again. Uh, can, am I sharing my screen or not? Mm -hmm. like, you're on the. Wait, I see it. I've got a. I got a share button I have to hit. Give me a second. Yeah. So, um, this is the way I, I wrote the. Uh, uh, we still don't see anything. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I don't know if this is it, but you have a sharing. There it goes. There we go. Thanks. And one more button. So uh, I, I've taken what Kim did and I've modified, I've added to what she did. So like her language where she has additional considerations, those are all right here, right? But I've added this language, secondary considerations. The board may consider uh, these submitted by the permittee. Uh, these issue erosion controls were permitted and installed in accordance with the laws in force at the time of the installation. I, I think what we're saying here is that if, if you've got something that you you uh, you threw in there, you never got a permit for it, you're less likely to get much consideration from us. And I did that in part because the chairman of BMRC made that pretty clear. In, in one of his uh, hearings recently. Um, another item here is prop notification of the damage. Uh, you know, going to Kim's comment, uh, if you let your, your, your erosion control deteriorate for years and come to us wanting to put it all back after it's gone, we're much less likely to, to be supportive. Now, the, the next one here is I think something that we really want to think about uh, is the proposed repair designed to restore controls to the original permitted condition or a condition that provides a betterment to the environment, such as elements of the living shoreline. Uh, I, I look for your comments on that. Uh, and then the last one here, documentation that a living shoreline or elements of a living shoreline would substantially detract from the property owner's yard area, impact on existing walkways, piers, access, or other things established. So, um, 
this is kind of going back to Dean's comment. It's something I'm putting in here with absolutely no criteria. It's the kind of thing where we're saying, we'll listen to you, but we may not necessarily make that the decision process. And the, one of the reasons I'm saying it that this way, calling the secondary considerations, is that that same Norfolk board hearing uh, that DMRC had, the Norfolk attorney who was defending their decision came before VMRC and said to them, we did hear from the applicant uh, a variety of impacts on them. However, we simply chose not to use those in making our decision. So, and, and I think that the VMRC attorneys generally agreed that Norfolk could have considered those things had they so desired. And I'll stop there for a comment. And was that a new bulkhead or what? Or was that an old one? Uh, Mark, you can probably speak to this better than I can, but it, my understanding is they had uh, existing riprap that deteriorated and they placed new riprap on top of it. Plus, they created an opening for a boat launch. And they effectively took some additional wetlands, not very much, uh, in so doing. Okay. Is, is that generally correct, Mark? I think that's correct, yeah. Um, I, I, I will say that, you, you know, the, of the things we've discussed here, you know, where we say if you have an existing erosion control, and you simply want to repair it, you want to restore it to the existing condition, or if there's a betterment. I, I think with the kind of policy we're talking about here, had that applicant come before us, we would have been open to considering approval. Uh, however, the Norfolk board was not. They rejected it. And DMRC supported the Norfolk DMRC on the decision, yeah. yes. Yes. However, you, you know, Mark, there's a very interesting introduction to that meeting, which I'd encourage everybody to listen to. Uh, the VMRC chair very carefully asked uh, the uh, VMRC attorney to describe the conditions over which VMRC can overturn the Norfolk board. And it, it really, was pretty clear as long as the board had considered all the appropriate items uh, and did so in a reasonable manner, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the MRC is low to overturn. I'm not saying that's, it was, but. that's a, that's a fair statement. You know, it's I, I think had the had the Hampton wet simply said. No, this is too expensive. We're going to approve it. A living shoreline would be too expensive. We're going to approve it. The VMRC would overturn that decision. But if they considered multiple arguments and discussed different alternatives, VMRC's position is not to. We want. We want to let you do your job. Clyde, I do like the original condition or betterment. I I I like the betterment idea because I think, you know, even if we're looking at somebody kind of repairing a bulkhead, if they if they offer us a betterment where they maybe do put in some core matting or something where it's appropriate, I think that is definitely more favorable. Um, and I like the idea that we put it in there to really kind of encourage that as well. I was actually thinking of going a little bit further and even saying that it's, there has to be a betterment as a result of any kind of rep uh, repair that's being conducted. But I think that might be a, a bridge too far here. Well, 
you know, we do have this admonition that where living shorelines are not suitable, ele uh, elements of a living shoreline should be required where, is the word where feasible? It actually says where feasible. But, you know, if you got a flat bulkhead, <laughs> you know, there's no place to put a living shoreline. You know, a piece of property just may not have it. Yeah. You know, uh, actually, I'm going to take that back a little bit. Uh, a number of years ago, the Wetlands Board had a, a property on the Potomac River where a, 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 uh, a living shoreline was not feasible because of the fetch. It was a, you know, four mile, five mile fetch. But the property owner wanted to place, they, they had a failing belt bulkhead. It, it had not failed, but it was failing. They did not have jurisdictional wetlands landward of the bulkhead like the permit we're looking at now. But their, their uh, contractor, instead of, you know, trying to put new boards in place, wanted to place a, uh, a new bulkhead like maybe 18 inches out in front of the existing bulkhead, which from an engineering point of view was, was a very practical thing to do. And the, uh, the board debated this back and forth. And ultimately we asked for a betterment. We asked for uh, a, a planting of, of plants out in front of the bulkhead, which, which would have been new SAB, not uh, new wetlands uh, uh, plants. And uh, the permittee was not happy, uh, but they did do it. Kim, I think you were on that one, weren't you? Uh yeah, well, we had we had looked at doing some of the Vembrita. I don't know if I was on the one with the SAV. I think that was just before me. Yeah, it didn't yeah it didn't we required uh, fire plants uh, on that? And, and it yeah, was we out were, in front. It wasn't in the jurisdictional wetland. Yeah, it was out in front, and then she didn't do it. <laughs> oh, did she not do it? She did not do it. Uh, so she's still in violation of her permit. Yeah. Catherine, just what you needed, right? More stuff to try to enforce. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I like the betterment idea. I'm not sure we could require it, but we could certainly encourage it. Which is what I'm trying to, we're doing here, right? We got a checklist of secondary considerations. Um, so the list that's down here under number five is, is, is what, uh, Kim proposed. And, and that list is a compilation of things we've heard from VIM staff, from BMRC staff, from others. Does, as Deanna has pointed out, it's impossible to have a comprehensive list of this. Uh, but does anyone have anything else they'd like to suggest there? Hearing none, um, everybody okay? We'll go on to the next item. How do I unshare? Yeah, move on. <laughs> okay, just uh, give me one second to pull the next thing up. Okay, so let me know if you all can see my screen again. Hopefully, you can. Yes. Um, so, Bert and Doug, the board members who unfortunately are not with us today, 
um, provided this draft edit of the brochure. Um, hey, Dean, is there any way we could mute? Because I feel like I'm getting a lot of feedback when I'm talking. Not a problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, I think that's a little bit better. Obviously, feel free to unmute when you when you need to speak. But um, yes, yeah, so I just sent this along um, earlier today. And Kim, I am showing your feedback integrated here because that was the last version I got from from someone with some additional thoughts. So um, I. I didn't get a download from Doug or Bert on kind of what their thought process was on this, but um, they certainly went through and provided some edits. Um, I, from my first glance, I didn't see anything like super substantive. Obviously, Kim, thanks for adding some pieces in here. Um, and I think at the end here, they wanted to provide some more references, but um, if we want to, we can try to walk through this some more. Otherwise, folks can look at it on their own or it's kind of up to you. So I just added some pieces because that brochure, I think, also covers floodplains and Chesapeake Bay Act things. And I just tried to make it a little more clear. Those were included as well. Okay. Yeah. And here we start to get into a little bit of like what the wetlands board may want to see in a final submission of an application. Again, we can recraft this list if we feel like it if it needs to more readily match or have more alignment with the checklist that you all are working on. So, um, so we've got that there. That could be augmented, obviously, and then the glossary. It would be an easy update too. Anything is else? Oh. What I'm thinking is, is the checklist too long? Do we put a link in there? What is the? I mean, so, how many pages were we looking at for that? Yeah, if I could uh, make a general comment. Uh, the outreach brochure needs to be one page. One page. I want somebody to so actually maybe, read this. Uh, so I, then focus just on tidal wetlands and not the other. Yes. It's tidal okay. wetlands only and it's it's one page. Uh and the whole idea is just to get people to know that they've got tidal wetlands and if they go to do anything, they need to jump in and look at these other documents. But I don't think we should even attempt to do all this. Okay. The only all, other... oh. I, I, I guess the other point I try to make is I, I, we're going to have to go through this, these different documents we've got, and to the extent we possibly can re remove redundancy. Uh, uh, th that that I think is going to be our most difficult task here. Uh, uh, okay. So so I, I've said that, but how do people react to that? Making this brochure just one page. I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking of this is something that we send out, or the county could send out to everybody with Title Wetlands, so they would actually open it and read it. So the Chesapeake Bay Act, one that they give to property owners, is it's a trifold, two sided. And maybe that, if we, if we go with that, that's an easy mailer to send and it's um, perhaps we can provide like a drawing or something. I don't know. I'm, what the county has done before. Yeah. I was going to say, um, you know, we, we also have um, 
Bert and Doug also found this VIMS uh, brochure that they have on living shorelines that could be something that gets um, passed along as well. Obviously, they were not recommending a rewrite of it, but just kind of thought that this was a good reference and something that we might want to um, hand out in the future. This looks like it's just folded in half, maybe so. As a standalone? Or maybe as something to accompany the, um, I forgot what the email said, but um, just as Got it. they thought it was worth, that it was worth um, sharing. So, it, it, you know, we established these four different committees and I, I really do, all of you have worked very hard on all this stuff. And, and I, sometimes I think you don't know where you're going until you get halfway through the journey. Um, but in, in this particular case, let me see if I can restate where we're going. I, I think that as you look at these four different documents, the, the lead document is this brochure. It's the document that we want people with to know that, that they have. It, it just keeps them aware that if they go to do something, oh, there's something else I got to do. But their, their next step really is to call the county. That's what we want this to do. We want to tell them call the county. And when they call the county, I, I think that the county's communication is the applicant guide. The applicant guide kind of introduces them to everything that's going on, you know, and, and the different other kinds of documents they need to look at. When they get to making a permit application, then we have the permit application itself and the supplemental guide. And, and then the last document we've got is the board book. The board book is for us. It's it's not really for the applicant. Uh, it's it's for us to understand everything we're trying to do and apply. I, I, how does everybody react to that? That seems reasonable to me. I think I think what would happen is I, I think the all the county got mixed up with the Chesapeake Bay Act stuff with the, you know, I, because it's all there in the same area. I think their intent was to try to call the county. It might not just be wetlands board, it might be other yeah. things. So I, I, I think that's why it got a little long, but it, I like that process. I like the way that we're looking at it. I think the brochure should also include, you know, contractor language or something that maybe we need to, because our contractors seem to be the issue here. They're doing work without a lot of thought to it. Should that be here though, or in supplemental information? The brochure? If you not go to a contractor until after you've read the applicant guide, right? Right, but what I'm saying is our our issue and that we need to try to hit the brochure with is the the brochure not just for the homeowner, but oh. for the contractors who work in Fairfax County. Yes, I I see your point. You, you, you want to say neither homeowners nor yeah. <laughs> maybe right. a way to say this is if, if your contractor says you're okay, don't believe. It. <laughs> necessarily <laughs> is that what you're trying to <laughs> I, I I think that's that's a very important message uh, it, it, at least one we've learned well listen I th this meeting has gone on quite long here I, I don't want to keep on this but uh, uh, I, I I think we all need uh, a lot more, it, it seems like merging the supplemental uh, application form and the checklist with the applicant guide is the thing to do. Um, 
wondering, um, we're kind of restrained here. We can only have two people work at this on the same time. Um, I, I guess what I want to ask for here is a volunteer to the merging. Okay, I'll volunteer to lead the merging. I, I need someone to assist me. How about a volunteer to assist me in the merging? And I hear Kim just, and, 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 and Dina and Dean just wanting to jump in here. This is Dina. Well, I'm a loud mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Deanna, what were you saying? I I said I was willing to help. Okay. All right. It's you and me. Uh, Kim, you got to figure out a way to get that brochure down to uh, something that can go in a mailer. That I can work on. I will work on the brochure and send it back to who worked on originally, Doug and Bert? Yes. Yeah. And, and we'll give Doug and Bert <laughs> another job when they're not here. Uh, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, Dean, by all means, I, I think you should go ahead and, and uh, make very specific proposals for what you want done to the board book. I will. Uh, uh, and Catherine, we're trying not to push too much of this back on you. Because I know you have nothing else to do, right? All it's right. all right. It's what we're here for. But, so before we leave this, Mark, are, are you still with us? Mark Eversall? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mark, you've been very patient. Uh, can you add any advice or comment to all of this? I can't. I, I, th I think you're on a, I think you're on a, on the right path here. I think, I do think we need to talk further in the future about, about the living shoreline and the, and the board's responsibility, but we don't need to do that tonight. Um, but I think you're, I think you're onto something here. This is, I think this is good. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. We'll keep at it. Uh, Katie, you're up. Okay. So I'll try to keep this quick and just talk for a couple minutes. I, during our Mar um, October, I think it was October 5th call um i gave you all a more in-depth briefer on some gpas that are routing this is my only slide just to regroup on a few things um i i strongly believe we're gonna have a couple gpas for the wetlands board to take formal consideration on here in calendar 2022 um a couple of them are violations that occurred, you know, in previous months. Um, the four zero zero one Bell River uh, Terrace location, um, the one eleven thirty seven one River Road. Uh, those two, uh, you know, the JPA has been submitted, and uh, we just. I just need to move forward with the applicants to have to schedule a hearing. Hopefully in the next few months, 6 months, depending on how we believe your meeting schedule will work out here. Um, for the 1st, part of 2022, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, there's another violation at 5709. Uh, River drive down there on the peninsula and um, I'm still waiting for JPA to be submitted from the applicant. Uh, but again, that's similar as we're trying to bring a, um, some, some property owners into compliance here. And then wanted to mention that we did receive a resubmission of the violation. On green drive near Massey Creek, and uh, that came in. I believe that was not this past Friday, but the Friday before, um, and I had emailed. Uh, sorry, I sent a uh, formal comments back to the applicant on that uh, resubmission of their JPA it was still 
missing quite a bit of information. So it's back with them. And then yeah, those are the those are the four or five main ones I, I wanted to give a quick update on. I, I still haven't heard much on that orange court. Uh, haven't gotten much of a response or the Stratford Landing proposed project, but I'll keep it after those folks. So. so that's my update there. Okay. Uh Catherine, when do you need another board meeting? Well, you know, I think some of this links back to if you all need to have another conversation about the materials you're working on. We do, but but okay. you don't have anything that you think we're going to have to come together on. I'm asking. Probably, probably not. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to think. Probably not for January or February. I think maybe the earliest would be March. And obviously, I would give you all a heads up if we if we received a complete JPA that needed that that action and needed a publication for the public hearing. So, Claude, you. I think maybe we reconvene in February just for the stuff we're working on. It gives us a month to kind of pull it together and send it around a few times. So, um, I have a level in January and February. Um, let me, uh, uh, uh can I ask this? Uh, well, uh, propose a date. What would you like to do? I was thinking towards the end of February, but that's okay. you know, third week or something. Uh, uh, Tuesday, the 22nd. That works. Gone. Catherine, can you send out an invitation for that time? Sure. Okay. Very good. And then the goal would be for everyone to bring the latest version. Uh, maybe before the meeting. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, as you produce drafts of this, uh, what I would like you to do, you know, work with whoever you're working with, send a draft to, to Catherine and Catherine can review it and send it back to you and she can blind carbon copy the rest of us. We can't respond back to you, but we can see it and comment to Catherine. So don't wait for the board meeting. <laughs> you know, do, do something uh, like halfway between now and then so, so that you get feedback on, on whatever you've drafted up. Does, does that make sense? We can try to have a goal of getting a draft sent around in a month and then maybe find yeah. a draft. So, so let's set up the meeting. That, that's a good point. So let's talk about a draft for January 24th. Okay. And, and Catherine, if you could put that in the meeting notes, that would be helpful. Just tell everybody, you know, we're expecting drafts by January 24th. Yeah. Everybody likes months. Yeah. yeah. Everybody likes separate email. Yeah. Everybody likes Monday uh, deadline so they can work through the weekend. Okay. Anything else? Next um, item, meet, meeting minutes. Yes. So I sent some of those around <laughs> from our last two meetings, the revision to the August meeting minutes based on feedback from Clyde and then meeting minutes from the October meeting. So, so could I ask 
for someone to move the meeting minutes. And we can't discuss the meeting limits until somebody makes a motion to pass them. Um, I make a motion that we accept the meeting minutes. Uh, I need a second. Second. Is there any discussion about the meeting minutes? Hearing no discussion, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, raise their hand and say aye. 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 All those opposed? The meeting minutes are adopted. Thank you, everyone. Okay. And I believe this is our last piece of the, the meeting agenda tonight, the public comment period. So give me one second if you got if you all don't mind, I will try to so before you move before you move to the public, oh. public comment period, there yes. is something I would like to discuss, not on the agenda. Um, that there have been a couple of projects in uh, Little Hunting Creek. Uh, and uh, these are projects that were approved prior to the 2020 law. Uh, they're, they're, they're county projects. One is a, uh, a water line and the other is a sewer line. Um, there, there have been some citizens uh, objecting to the way that the sewer line went in, uh, improper, uh, at least accusations of improper construction techniques. I, I, I believe most of those are passed. Um, however, um, the project is still going on and is not gonna be closed out until June. And uh, what I would like to do if, if the board is amenable to it, is I would like to ask the county to essentially go through the, the process uh, for the closeout of the project that they would have had to have done had they applied uh, to the wetlands board uh, this year. Um, uh, and the reason I would like to do this is uh, I think the public could reasonably be displeased that we're imposing new requirements on them that the county has just barely slipped under the radar and not been required to address. Uh, and uh, I've discussed this a little bit with some people in county engineering and the public works director, and they're amenable at least to discussing it. Uh, but before I keep going in that direction, uh, I'd I, I, I kind of like a consensus of the weapons board itself. Um, any discussion about this? Seems like a reasonable approach to, here, to my eye. Yeah, we, we have a new public works director, um, uh, and uh, you know we did have some upset people back in August. Uh, my understanding is they've tried to work towards resolving that, uh, but the contractor is still there. Uh, so uh, I, I think we still have an opportunity to ask the county to go through this. Uh, so if it's all right with you, I will go ahead and just informally ask them about that. Um, a second aspect of this is, um, I don't remember how many of you were here on the board when the Hunting Creek uh, uh, embankment was constructed and pump station. Was anybody here for that? Uh, the, the former chair was most displeased that the county went ahead with that project and did not ask for wetlands board review. How would, something I'd, I'd like you to consider for the next meeting. I'm, I'm thinking of asking the county to do a memorandum of understanding between us that although we don't have the authority to approve or disapprove their actions, I, I, I think we could have avoided some of the headaches with the public that happened this summer had the county run the, the project past us. Uh, they would have had a little bit more guidance on 
what was really needed to protect little hunting. What, what do people think about that? Are you amenable to asking the county to coordinate with us? Uh, I'm amenable. I, I, I think it's the appropriate thing to do. They should be coming to us. We are a county board, not just for, I mean, not that we can provide approval, but we can certainly provide comments and concerns that save them time in the long run. Dean, any comment? I, the only thing I could think of is would the county staff be willing to do this in the sense that is if they're not if they're just going to shut you down is there any point of, of the discussion i will tell you that the, the tone of the discussion i've had with both the, the the head of wastewater engineering who's running this project and, and the public works director is they feel it would be better that they're in a better position to communicate with the public if they can say they dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And I think the pro problems that they had at this current project, uh, I think they recognize could have been avoided. Sounds good to me. Yeah, so, sounds very much um, more efficient and transparent. Yes, and, and it, okay, I will proceed and move in that direction. I think I must have reversed my camera somehow. I don't even know how I did that. There you go. Uh, all right. Um, back to the public comment period. Uh, Catherine. Yes. Um, I mean, it. I don't have any particular slides to show. Obviously, what I can do is go ahead and unmute everyone on the line. And if there are folks from the public who want to share or ask a question, uh, Clyde, I think we usually try to keep any statements to like three minutes, correct? If someone wants to make a direct statement. I think our only visitor is Larry Zaragoza. Is that correct? Um, Maybe. Unmute him. There may be one other caller. All right, go ahead. So David Patterson is also a visitor too. Okay, I will unmute him as well. Thank you. Mr. Patterson, would you like to uh, go first? If you um, have any yeah. comments. Uh, hi, thank you. I um, appreciate the opportunity to, to listen in. Um, and and it, I spoke at the uh, planning commission hearing and it was a voice from from Wessington. So uh, it, it helps to to hear the discussion and some of the uh, deliberation that's going on 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 the guidelines for for uh, yeah for for the wetlands board. So uh, anyways, no no comments other than thank you. Um, look forward to uh, seeing the the documents and, and maybe the follow on meeting in February. Then. Very good. Mr. Zaragoza. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to thank you and the rest of the board for your thoughtful deliberations on this topic. Um, I, uh, I would also note that I think it's really important that the uh, supplemental materials and the um, and the guidance itself all be written in a way such that they're consistent. Um, I, I worry a little bit that some of the things we were talking about, for example, bulkheads, that I guess you were just talking about having that show up in the latter parts, and um, and I think that you know it's it's important that they come across as, as it comes across as one coherent guidance. Uh, but I very much appreciate your efforts to address the concerns that have been raised, uh, and uh, you've obviously put a lot of thought into this process and. And I appreciate it, and I know a lot of a lot of my neighbors and and others do as well. So thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, any other comment from any of the board members or anyone else? 
Hearing none, could I hear a motion to close the meeting? And, and, one more. And, one and more. Um, oh. wait, wait, I'm listening. One more. Yes, very, very quickly. Uh, Peter Bernard here um, representing the Mount Vernon uh, Association. I uh, wanted to also thank uh, everybody on, on your board for uh, the great effort and diligence that and the time and effort that you've put in in uh, thinking about these problems. Uh, this is my very first uh, meeting and listening to you. And I will go back to our board and uh, mention to them how hard you're working on this. I would like to also get the um, written materials, if possible, when you when you completed them, uh, to just to look at them and review them. Yes. Um, I don't have anything else to to kind of add except um, I appreciate the hard work that all of you put into this effort. Very good. Thank you for your comments. Thank uh, you. Did I miss anybody else? Okay. Uh, back to I hear a motion to close. I make a motion to close the meeting. Second. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The meeting is closed. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know this is a big effort. I will try to keep the meetings shorter in the future. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Stay safe. Have a great, have a great Christmas, everyone. You yes, too. And Captain, go find that kid. They could have joined the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, get out of here. Go. No, it, it's all right. <laughs> it's a regular public meeting. Of course, he could come. <laughs> oh, thanks. Have a good evening. I appreciate it. All right. Um, all right. Is it just us? Are we the only one left? And the meeting yeah. is closed. Um, I did have an opportunity to go look at those drawings and the application. And I got to tell you, it's really weird. Be because there's a, a report from wetland studies, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they go through and they, in, in the application, they, they talk about, how do you say that? Pleistocene forest. Yeah. The upland forest, they, they describe all that. But then in the application itself, they say there's over 4,000 square feet of disturbed tidal wetlands. And when you look at the mm. profile, it's pretty clear they're running through wetlands. They've got to be. Uh, I, on one side, they go up the slope towards the road, and, and there's no way they can avoid going through the, the tidal wetlands there. On the mm. other side, they're running through a bulkhead, but they're removing the bulkhead. <laughs> so, so I, I, if if that's county land, then I think it is. They could very easily put that back in as a living shoreline, rather than not very easily. They could have restored that as a living shoreline, rather than a uh, bulkhead. However, this permit is from 2019. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, clearly had the permit before the law was in place. Yeah. Uh, I did uh, mention I talked to uh, uh, I, I talked to the uh, the head of the wastewater engineering uh, implementation group. I've known him a long time. Uh, he was, you know, Tim called me about this and was bent out of shape about it. And he, his the point he made with me was they had a bunch of controversy over this back in August, but he hadn't heard anything since then. Um, but yeah. he clearly wants, yeah, he wants to close the project out very carefully. So I, I think I'm going to go back to him and say, look, all you have to really do is pick up the VMRC guidance and, and just run through it. And, you know, more importantly, maybe talk with you, you know, could mm -hmm. we put some wetlands in here? And, and I think they can, uh, and, and they're still out there digging and, and playing in dirt. So I think they have a chance to do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to, I mean, I, 
unfortunately, I didn't know anything about this, like I said, and then I was looking at the 1 email. That I did see today. And that again, like you said, it was from August and then it's been silent. So I don't know. If yeah, but even more so happened or the permit, the permit was done in 2019. You know, why would you even hear about it? You know, no. <laughs> and, and uh, but I don't you, like it. You, I don't know if you noticed on those emails back and forth, but there's two former wetlands board members on there. Yeah, plus some other yeah. advocates that have been headaches in the past. I'm amazed they didn't call me. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of upset at them too. <laughs> but you know, yeah, I, I think the county can make a lot of points here uh, for, for not a lot of effort. Okay. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give Matt a call tomorrow and see if I can chat about this and see if there's something I can do to I don't know, come out and take a look at the site and, you know, kind of go from there. Or... Well, you, you know, I, I, I really don't get this either. Wetlands, uh, wetland studies did this and they didn't suggest any, uh, uh, any, any, uh, living shoreline. That's crazy. I, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Either that, or they suggested it and it didn't become part of the final project because of cost or something I, I mean i'm not saying that's an excuse or anything but I don't, like obviously we were not part of any of those conversations yeah. i mean maybe that's something i can ask matt about if that was anything that they explored again i mean they did more... i i talked to matt he'd never heard of this law he didn't know what a living shoreline was uh you See, know this is the kind of outreach like i i tell people about People from DPW and ES, like his, the, the department he works within, were made aware of this plan amendment. I, you know, like I, I can't email all like sixteen thousand employees of the county and say, "Who wants well, look, to know more but, about but you've this? got a, a whole bunch of flux going on here too. You have a brand new public works director, just showed up, what like two weeks ago, and yeah. you've got. Uh, uh, the head of engineering, Ron Kirkpatrick, just retired, right? Now, the guy taking over there has been there forever, so he, he should really know. But th these people, they don't work in tidal wetlands very often. It's just unusual. Sure. You know? uh, so, so I'm not here to beat anybody up. Let's. I, I really would like to just make mm -hmm. some points for the county and the wetlands board, you know, say this wasn't required, but we got it done anyway. Uh, I, I think the last thing I want to do is, is, is have this project go in and let them put a bulkhead back in where they could have put a little of each shoreline in. <laughs> right, right. Okay. All right. More well, to come. Yeah. I can try to keep you guys updated on that. Okay. All right. Okay. Take care. If we don't talk, have a great Christmas. Oh, yeah, I hope you enjoy some time off and get to see some friends and family and. Have a good, have a, have a good time. Yeah, my, my wife and I are, uh, are, are, tra are traveling. We're, we're going to visit her sister. In Sarasota in January and February, we're leaving the snow to you. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and, and then we're taking my other grandson. Uh, to Disneyland. We're all going to come back with COVID, I'm sure. Just take a really good mask <laughs> <laughs> or a couple really good masks, like good quality ones. All right. We'll keep yeah. that. Okay. Well, I'll be take in touch. Care. All take right. Care. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.